About a year ago, I described my perfect dream camera. Full frame, 4K, up to 120 frames per second, nice dynamic range, good autofocus, good color science, a flip LCD screen, and maybe throw in some IBIS in there. And now we have the Canon EOS R5, which is all of those things and more. Full frame 8K raw and all eye. We got 4K, 120 frames per second. We got C log, great autofocus, nice color science, flip LCD screen, IBIS and insane photos. But still with all of these features, why are people saying they're canceling their pre-orders and they're thinking about switching over to Sony? If you're into cameras as much as I am, you've probably heard it all by now. And probably the biggest thing is the overheating. I was hoping that it wouldn't be that big of a deal and it was just kind of blown out of proportion, but the overheating is definitely there. But let's take a second and just look at what happened here. It's interesting to me because Sony has usually been the one just packing in features and specs and then they have to deal with some overheating. Whereas Canon has been much more conservative with lackluster specs. And now Canon is packing in the specs and just putting in all the features and they're dealing with overheating. And Sony is taking it down a notch and going a little bit more reserved and having less overheating. But also all of the DSLRs and mirrorless cameras that Canon has ever made have been photo first cameras. They are hybrid, but photography has always come first with them. They don't make any DSLRs or mirrorless cameras that are video first. For example, the Canon EOS R, which came out, was very controversial. People thought it really sucked and the specs were so lackluster, but I learned to like it really quickly and even chose the R over the flat last year Sony a7 III, but the Canon EOS R is a photo camera that can also do some video. The R5 is a 45 megapixel up to 20 frames per second photo beast camera that also does some pretty great video. But I think that's part of the problem so far with the R5. The marketing was heavily around 8K and the video features when they should have been focusing on the photo features and just been like, oh, hey, it also does some really great video. I think Canon still thinks that photography is the future of their business. And I'm sure it has been for like the longest time, but we're starting to see kind of a drop in photography, I think, and videography in comparison is just, just growing like crazy. Or maybe photography isn't dropping, but the video side is just growing like crazy. But now that they led with the 8K video thing, people are complaining because there are some issues with the 8K video because this is a photo first camera that also does some really great video or at the very least, it's a hybrid camera. And I assume because it's such a high megapixel camera, they're like, well, we could do 8K. So let's give them 8K. Let's give them all of the Ks. Give them 120 frames per second in 4K. Let's give them all of those features, all of the specs, including IBIS. Enjoy. Here you go and then we get overheating. So we have the Canon EOS R, very lackluster. Specs aren't quite enough equals outrage. And then we get all of the specs and that also leads to outrage. And I apologize for this long intro for this review, but cameras are so different. For example, Sony is deciding to kind of make some cameras that are very photography first cameras, for example, the A7R line, and then some cameras that are video first, like the A7S line. Whereas the Canon R5 is a hybrid camera that can do really great photography and filmmaking. Ironically, I'm a filmmaker first, so I barely <laughs> tested the photography at all because I'm a lot more interested in the video side of the R5. Speaking of video, nobody believed it when we first started to hear about it, but yes, we get 8K raw and all eye, which is really nice inside of the Canon EOS R5. And it looks really good. Now, full disclosure, most of the videos that I've filmed, even in the past year or so, 
have been in 1080 and then I just up res them to 4K for YouTube. So what's the point of using 8K? Now, for most people, I, I do think it's still overkill and for somebody like me, for example, I'm probably not gonna use 8K that much, but there are some really nice advantages to 8K. For example, being able to crop in and reframe, we can zoom in, we can add some movement into our shots. There's a lot of things that we can do with 8K and you're literally not gonna lose any resolution or any quality zooming in. It's also kind of nice knowing that your camera is kind of future proof. I I'm not talking about filming everything in 8K, so so that in the future you'll be able to enjoy the 8K quality. I'm just saying that you'll probably be able to use this camera for many years because we're not even really at 8K level yet. So when 8K does come, maybe in a few years, you can still use the R5. And I think it was Tyler Stallman who asked on Twitter, what are, what are the real world uses for 8K? And probably the most important one that I could see is being able to crop in and get multiple angles on one shot. You can just set up a wide or a medium shot like this, and then you can punch in to get that close up, and you're not gonna really lose any detail, especially going from 8K to 4K because you have so much resolution to play with. And with with 8K, since you have so much resolution, you might even be able to get three different camera angles, a wide, a medium, and a tight, all from one camera. So that's kind of a real world use for 8K right now. We also have 4K HQ, which is taking that whole beautiful 8K image and scaling it down to 4K. HQ high quality. We also get a more basic form of 4K, which doesn't overheat, that's really nice. And I heard that it would be pixel bin, and that's basically just taking again that big 8K resolution and kind of combining pixels to make almost super pixels. This is not the technical engineering way of explaining this. And in theory, you would have less noise and a cleaner image, but I'm not really seeing that and it looks softer and not as good, definitely not as good as the 4K HQ. So I don't know if they're line skipping or I don't know what's going on here, but there is a noticeable difference in between the 4K HQ and the normal 4K. The difference between the 8K and the 4K HQ I really couldn't see any difference. Now, yeah, you can zoom in more on the 8K, but just looking at them, I couldn't see any difference. 1080 also looks a lot softer. I'd probably compare it to something like the Canon EOS R. Maybe it's a little bit cleaner because of the 8K sensor, but it's definitely softer. And then 4K, 120 frames per second. It looks so good. I'm so glad that 120 frames per second is back better than ever. Now it is a little bit softer than the 4K HQ or the 8K, but it still looks really great. And best of all, there are no crops in any of the modes and autofocus works in all of the modes. There's no weird restrictions like we've seen in some past Canon cameras. I'm really happy about that one. And I have to say the image is really nice and clean, so much cleaner than something like the EOS R, which is maybe a little bit of an fair comparison, but it's really nice. And now we get 8K time lapses instead of the normal 4K, which is really nice for time lapses. It's great being able to zoom in. I do wish we had log for the time lapses. I don't know why we can't have that. I'd like a little bit more dynamic range, but 8K time lapses, big thumbs up. On top of the massive resolution, we also get crazy bit rates, which is really nice for color grading and getting the most out of your footage, but it's also pretty bad for your wallet and for your hard drive space. I recorded 10 second clips just to give you guys a little bit of an understanding, and in 8K, for 10 seconds, it's a whopping 1.66 gigabytes. That's a lot of data. In 4K HQ, it's 590, and in normal 4K, it's also 590, which is interesting. For some reason, I thought the normal 4K would be less since it doesn't look as good, but basically, the processor just has to work a lot harder, uh, and you get the same data rate. In 1080, it was 171 megabytes, and then, 
Get this one, 4K, 120 frames per second is 2.37 gigabytes for 10 seconds of footage. That's a lot of data. You are gonna fill up all of your hard drives really fast. Now we do get IPB, which is gonna drop the bit rates about a third. So that's nice, but you are gonna have in theory at least worse quality. I didn't get a chance to test out the IPB or do any comparisons, uh, but it is really nice having all of these different codecs and resolutions. There's just so many options and so many flavors that you get all inside of one little mirrorless camera. How bad is it to edit with? Real bad. <laughs> Premiere, uh, the normal Premiere doesn't even, the colors are all just crazy. It looks really bad. Uh, so you have to use the Premiere Beta right now. And even with that, it not only like, you know, the, the spinning wheel of death in, in uh, Premiere, the freezing, the crashing, we've dealt with it but this is next level. It actually just shuts down your whole computer right now. Like every once in a while, just randomly, I don't know what does it, my whole computer just shuts off. And so I've been editing on Final Cut Pro 10, which of course it just works in there. No updates, no nothing. It just works right away. But I've been using proxies because it is so slow, especially the 8K footage. It is really, really slow. Also Lightroom doesn't support the RAWs yet, so you can't get the most out of your photos on the R5 yet. And there is no real good solution for 8K RAW uh, to actually be able to edit the RAW footage. So that's why I didn't shoot any RAW footage because there was no real way of actually utilizing the RAW right now. And then let's talk about IBIS. And I found this to be really comedic. So many people wanted IBIS. And then when they got IBIS and they saw it, they're like, uh... Nope, I don't want that. And I think a lot of that just comes from people not fully understanding IBIS or how it works, but it is an incredible tool. Just look at the difference between these shots, uh, me doing a static handheld shot with IBIS and then without IBIS. There's a massive difference there. Or add in some movement, here's without IBIS and then we turn on the IBIS, the difference is so drastic. And then for photography, this IBIS is insane. I wanted to see how long I could keep the shutter open and still get a nice, crisp, sharp image handheld. Take a guess how long I had the shutter open for this photo. Five seconds, a five second handheld exposure and it was still really sharp. You look at the water and it's just all smoothed out but the buildings are still really sharp. Five seconds, handheld, that's what IBIS can do. I think IBIS might actually be more of a photographer's tool than a filmmaker's tool. But there are some downsides to IBIS in the video world. If you're on a super wide angle lens, like the 15 to 35 mil RF mount, at 15, you are gonna get some corner wobbling. And I don't know exactly why that is. I assume it's because of the distortion of the lens and the sensor actually moving to stabilize the image. That's what's happening with IBIS. And this is not a Canon thing. It's across the board. Whenever you have really powerful, strong IBIS, you're gonna have have some wobbling, whether it's the GH5 or the Olympus cameras, it always happens on really wide angle lenses. Now, if you zoom in a little bit, even at a 35 mil, you're not gonna really see any wobbling, especially on something like a 7200. You're not gonna have any wobbling. You're just gonna have a super, super stable image. Also, quick note, there was a firmware update for the 15 to 35. And after I did that, I feel like the wobbles weren't as bad. So maybe the IS and the IBIS are working better together now. Just a theory. Also, my other theory is that it's gonna be worse in 8K because it's just so much processing. So it's almost wobbling different up here than it is down here. I could be wrong, but those are just my theories. And if you don't want IBIS, you can shut it off. If the lens has IS, you just use the IS switch and it turns it off. If it doesn't have IS, then you just go into the menus and you can shut it off. Now, I don't know why they made the switch for the IS, the switch for the IBIS also, because if I turn off the IBIS, I still want my lens stabilization on. So that's a bit of a bummer and I, I hope that gets fixed in some firmware because ideally I want control over all of the different forms of stabilization in the camera. But IBIS is a great and incredible tool. I'm not really sure why people are freaking out so much. 
Then let's talk about the biggest issue, the overheating. I did a whole video on this. Yes, it overheats. No, you should not put it in your fridge to cool it down. I was just doing it for the sake of science and I only had a very limited time. The overheating is definitely an issue and it might be my only big negative for this camera. IBIS, not an issue. Overheating, definitely an issue. Uh, when I tested it out in 8K, I got 17 minutes of footage before it overheated. In 4K HQ, I got 18 minutes and 40 seconds. And the worst one is by far 4K 120. I only got 14 minutes and 30 seconds. And these were all at room temperature. In the normal 4K mode, I could not get it to overheat, which is nice. You can always film in normal 4K, even if you can't in any of the other modes because of the overheating. And it's not just that it overheats, it takes a really long time for you to be able to use it again. And that's probably the bigger problem. It wouldn't be that bad if it just like overheated and you just had to wait a couple minutes and then you could turn back the camera and then use it again. It could take many minutes, 10, 20 minutes sometimes for you to be able to use, for example, 120 frames per second in 4K again. So yeah, that sucks a lot. I'm not happy about that. In 8K, it's understandable. If they would have said from the beginning that you're gonna get five minute 8K burst, I would have been like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. They're giving us 8K. For me, the worst is the 120 frames per second in 4K because there's moments when I'm filming stuff like at sunset in Dubai or somewhere, I can't have the camera overheat after just 14 minutes and then have to wait 10, 20 minutes for it to come back. I'm gonna miss the sunset completely and I'm not gonna get my shots. So overheating is a really big issue for us filmmakers, for photographers. I don't think it really matters that much. And it is one of the biggest reasons why I am considering the Sony systems now instead of the R5, which is, it, it's crazy to even say that because when I first heard about the R5 specs, I was like, this camera is the one camera to rule them all. It is the most insane thing ever. But of course, specs are only one side of the story. I have also seen and heard rumors, not from Canon, but online, that they're gonna try to address the issue in some way, whether it's firmware, or I've even heard rumors of a hardware fix, which would probably need some sort of recall or something. I don't know if they're gonna go that far, but I could see some firmware fixes coming, hopefully. Hopefully. The camera body is very similar to what we're used to with the Canon EOS R. It is a little bit bigger, just a tiny bit bigger. And we get the joystick back, which is really nice. I hated the touch bar on the EOS R. And the flip LCD screen now clears the mic plugin, so that's really nice. It doesn't get caught on it all the time. Overall, I would say the R5 body is probably one of the nicest to hold in your hand. It just fits really well. You get one SD slot, one CF Express slot. There aren't really dual slots. Uh, in the way that you would want to use them. But it is nice that you can record a lot of the different formats onto SD, except for 8K and the 4K 120 frames per second, which the 120 frames per second is one of the best things about the camera. So I think most people will need the CF Express cards, which are pretty expensive. Rolling shutter, it's not terrible, but it's not perfect either. It is better than I expected, especially for when you think about how many pixels it's having to go through, I was expecting a lot worse rolling shutter. So that's nice to see that it's not too bad. When it comes to low light, it's not the Sony a7S III, which is the king of low light, but it's pretty good, especially in the 8K and 4K HQ modes. Uh, I would say in 12,800 ISO, it looked pretty clean to me, very usable. And even at 51,200, it's definitely noisy, but the noise is pretty fine. And I feel like you could denoise it pretty easily. And I would even say, and I didn't do side-by-side -side comparisons, but I would say that the noise is more fine on the R5 when comparing it to the Sony a7S III, I think. I'd have to do side-by-side -side comparisons, but that's what it looked like to me at first. The normal 4K is definitely not as good in low light. It gets a lot noisier and that's why I'm thinking it might not be pixel bin because I feel like you would get better performance, but I could be wrong. 
I'm not a technical engineer. Dynamic range is pretty great with the C-Log, but it isn't as good as, for example, the Sony cameras. Now I have heard a rumor online that they're gonna be adding in C-Log 3, which would be really great. That's way more dynamic range. And I would love to actually see that. It would be a massive upgrade for the Canon R5. Also saw that they might be adding 120 frames per second in 1080, which would be nice because that most likely wouldn't overheat. So if the 4K 120 overheats, you could probably still use the 120 frames per second in 1080. And then photos, I don't think we're gonna have any issues here. I didn't have a chance to take very many photos, but I'm pretty sure this is gonna be an insane photography camera for most photographers. So that is the Canon EOS R5, a hybrid camera for the people that need both really great photography and really great video. And it fills a nice gap where there wasn't really a camera that did both photo and video in a really, really nice way. So you kind of had to choose one or the other or have one camera that does this and another camera that does this. Now you can get both high quality photos and video in one camera. Are there drawbacks? Yes. So who is this camera for? I feel like you could use this camera for so many different things. Uh, wedding videos, wedding photography, studio photography, sports photography, pretty much any kind of photography this thing can really do. YouTube filmmaking, vlogging, definitely. It's possibly one of the best vlogging cameras out there in terms of high quality, but still easy enough to use. Travel filmmaking, 100%, mini docs, corporate stuff. Yeah, I think it could do that, just not an 8K. But in the end, this is a hybrid camera, so it is for the hybrid shooters, the people that do some wedding films and some wedding photography, the Instagrammers who take a lot of photos but also need some video. A lot of YouTubers would really love it because it's great for filming yourself, but you can also take really nice thumbnails and photos for your social media. So those are the people that I think are really gonna benefit from the Canon EOS R5. I'm sure I missed a bunch of things because it's a really complex camera, but I'm curious, what do you guys think? Uh, did you pre-order it? Did you cancel your pre-order? Do you love it? Do you hate it for some reason? I wanna know what you guys think of the Canon EOS R5, and I hope this review got you a little bit closer in figuring out if this camera is the best camera for you and your filmmaking or photography needs. All right, my voice is pretty much gone. I've been talking a while. I'll see you guys later.